down here. Podium. I need that. I need that thing. All right, hello Melbourne. It is an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. It's amazing to see that everyone got here safely. Thank you so much. Even though it looks like I might be footing the bill, still, that's probably their superiors. So thank you to the police that kept everyone safe coming in here. And Instead of reminding us all that 
A journalism degree is simply a barista certificate. <laughs> what are they so afraid of us coming here to talk about? Well, globalization is presenting humanity with new and difficult questions that we have never faced before. Questions of who are we and what is the basis of our identity? Are we defined by our religion, our ethnicity? Are we defined by our culture, our geography, our gender, or even our governments? These questions are not simple. And for those of us who have not found satisfactory uh, answers to them, you can be forgiven. It's going to take a long time to find them. The group of citizens who work within the Australian government, they proposed one answer, and that answer is multiculturalism. According to this document, the Multicultural Australia Statement, Australian identity should be based not on race, religion, or culture, but on shared values such as freedom, democracy, and the rule of law and equality of opportunity. And that's fair enough. That is one legitimate response to a very thorny problem we have here. But that does not mean that any alternative proposals are illegitimate. It doesn't mean that we should stop exploring this question. I mean, we had an answer to how the solar system worked for a very long time. Obviously, the sun rotates around the Earth, you idiots. <laughs> Hashtag sun orbiting is our strength. Hashtag don't listen to anti-Earth bigots. <laughs> it's simple. Uh, however, it was through the process of open inquiry that we painstakingly became aware that just because we had an established answer for a long time, didn't mean it was correct. And the only reason that this inquiry happened was because people like Galileo were willing to be persecuted for it to, for their ideas to be espoused. And I really hate it when we pretend we're better than these people. I hate it when we say, oh, they had hate speech laws back then. They had, or rather, they had blasphemy laws. Look at these people, they were so oppressive towards science. Now, we're not better than them. The only thing that has changed in the persecution here are the questions being asked and the questions being suppressed. So my point is that when it comes to the proposal that we should be multicultural, you do not have to immediately accept this solution. It is completely legitimate that you are unsatisfied and remain unconvinced. I will continue to give multiculturalism a fair shot. I have for a while, and to debate and to challenge and critique multiculturalism is a part of that fair shot. And although I remain unconvinced, I would never attempt to silence the defenders of this idea because it is our willingness to listen to and defend the perspectives of others and the perspectives of those in which we, which we disagree that gives us our legitimacy. And on the contrary, those who are unwilling to consider alternative perspectives, those who rather than listening and challenging the people they disagree with, instead of choose to put an end to inquiry at all, they have chosen to relinquish their legitimacy. Because the only people who can partake in the discussion about our future and where this is headed are those who demonstrate a willingness to partake. The people that are outside there protesting and shrieking and screaming into the wind, they are objectively ignorant of what is happening in this room right now. And they can't disprove their ignorance. Because they are out there condemning the idea of inquiry itself. Not only are they opposed to becoming informed themselves, not only are they opposed to this discussion, but they don't even want you to be informed. They want all of Australia and New Zealand to be left in the dark and to be as ignorant as they are. They pluck out their own eyes and say, follow me, I see the way. The thing is, though, that as hard as these protesters try to shut down inquiry, as much as they want us to ignore these behemoths of questions that we face, at some point or another, we are going to be forced to answer them. Will the West remain largely homogenous? Will we become post-national states, as Trudeau likes to say? Will we embrace all languages and legal practices? And how far can our tolerance go? We can either answer these things now, with well-mannered debate and discussion, or we can wait until battle lines are drawn, and then we'll really see how far our tolerance goes. We have a responsibility to our children, to our nation, and to ourselves to engage in these difficult discussions while we can still do it peacefully, before we are faced with disastrous scenarios. And this 
is especially when the solutions that we've been given by our government have inspired so little confidence. For example, the Australian government suggests that your identity should not be based on cultures, or on culture rather, but instead on values. Even on its face, this proposal seems a little half-baked, because aren't values themselves, in fact, just a facet of culture? Isn't this, this just a reiteration of the statement that, indeed, Australian identity is based on culture? If you literally look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of culture, it says it is the shared set of values. So how can they say that your identity is based not on culture, but on values, it's the exact same thing. So furthermore, the values listed by the Australian government, freedom, democracy, the rule of law, and equality of opportunity, not only are these values themselves forms of culture, but they are characteristic of one culture, and one culture only, and that is Western culture. It didn't just fall down from the sky. It was the culmination of thousands of years of cultural cultivation. The dirt here is not magical, as much as we would love it to be. You can't hand someone vegetables. You can't throw an awesome bush hat on them. You can't make them binge watch Crocodile Dundee and then expect them to suddenly not want to caliphate. That is not how it works. Freedom of speech and the vast set of laws and literature defending its existence have been rooted in Western European ideas. Free speech defense can first be found in Athens, in Rome, to the English Bill of Rights, and then to the American First Amendment. Democracy was invented in Greece, and then it was reinvented in America as a republic. The rule of law was invented in England, and if we're being more specific here, certainly secular law. Law that was decided based on the rights of the individual, and law that considered all people equal under it. The people who came up with these ideas, they were from England. The philosophers and theologians like John Locke and A.B. Dicey, they popularized the term rule of law. So they say that your identity here in Australia is not defined by culture, and then they cite culture as its defining characteristic. Multiculturalism is a consequence of classical liberalism. The ideology that says we should have tolerance for ideas and perspectives with which we disagree. So if respect for liberalism, or if respect for liberal Western principles is essential to multiculturalism, what about those cultures who do not respect Western liberalism? What about those who do not agree with tolerance? What about the cultures who do not believe in the right of other cultures to exist? Should they give up their culture when they come to our multicultural paradises? If yes, then that's not really multiculturalism, is it? Or if they should not give up their cultures, is it then okay that they continue to dislike Western freedoms? Is it then okay that they continue to potentially oppress and shut down the existence of other cultures? You'd think that the men and women who make up our elites, the people that are in their ivory towers, the head of our media, the Harvard and Princeton graduates, you'd think they would have asked a couple of these questions before they freaking legislated these things. Is multiculturalism, or the setting up of cultural enclaves that speak different languages, that refuse to interact with each other, not just the creation of balkanized areas within a larger border, why not just create new countries? Is this not how countries came to be in the first place? People that spoke different languages and had different ideas wanted to only be around each other and then create their own laws? Why are we creating this within our own country? And really, and, I mean, maybe some cannibalistic cuisine. We could really get those 
human thigh food trucks for the enriched Papua New Guinean cultural experience. <laughs> Mental gymnastics used to characterize leftist rhetoric hardly does justice to this spaghetti of questions that we are presented with when it comes to multiculturalism. So rather than saying that Australia is a multicultural country, why not just say that Australia is a Western country based on Western values? Australia is multicultural. It does not inspire confidence, it certainly doesn't inspire unity, and even the government itself seems utterly unconvinced of its own ideas. So that there are those among us who remain skeptical, that there are those among us who aren't satisfied by this, it shouldn't be a crime and it should not make us pariahs in our society. You are not literally Hitler just because you have the brain cells to rub together to see that this is so contradictory. It doesn't even make sense in theory, and we've legislated it. It's like a bunch of our politicians trying to go high in someone's garage when they saw someone's mom with a coexist sticker on her back, and they said, you know what would be lit, man, if we just, we all got along. Now let's, let's just make them along. Screw it, we're not going to ask any more questions. So really, please, 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 if you do anything, do not let the slander and do not let the hatred of those who want to end discussion put Put out that spark of curiosity. Put out that spark in your drive to understand things further, because we need that. So I've just spent the first half of my speech explaining why I should have the right to give this speech, why this critique should be allowed, and I hate that I have to spend so much time explaining that, but it seems that it's necessary in this day and age. So let's finally get into the actual arguments of why I dislike, or am not a fan, of multiculturalism. And if you listen to any part of this speech, please, please, please pay attention here. You can forget everything else, I don't care, I won't be offended, but this part here. <laughs> Multiculturalism and the changes that it will wreak are not something that are merely superficial. They're not simply cosmetic. Multiculturalization is a radical and extreme idea that uproots and overturns the very essence of what a country is. To multiculturalize a country, it's like turning your house into public property. Your house is no longer your space, it's everyone's space. You no longer have any more say in what happens in your space or to your space than anyone. To multiculturalize your space is to relinquish your autonomy and your sovereignty. It is to abdicate your authority to decide what happens in your domain. Indeed, it is to concede that this is not your domain and that you have no domain. You would not want your spouse that you had been in a long and loving, successful relationship with to come to you one day and say, I'm polyamorous. <laughs> the reason you wouldn't like that is because we realize that the significance of marriage and the significance of a relationship comes from the idea of exclusivity. The heart that belongs to everyone belongs to no one. The nation that belongs to everyone belongs to no one. should be treated with the same respect and deadly seriousness as any question that touches on the power of people's economy and self-determination. It should not be left to a small group of elites, but just like in Quebec, or Catalonia, or Scotland, multiculturalization should be put to a referendum after an informed and thorough public debate. Westerners have already decided their path. They've, they've decided to give up their identity.
which legally became the first multicultural country ever. You guys were second, actually, although we have a pissing contest over that. We like to brag about, ooh, we're more multicultural than you. Actually, I think you guys say we are the most successful multicultural country. I think you know that's your homes for that. Uh, but the reality is that most people in both our countries don't really know what multiculturalism is. And in fact, they believe that it is the exact opposite of what it is. Many Canadians seem to believe that multiculturalism means that Canada will accept people of all different skin colors from all across the world, and then they'll come here and assimilate to our culture, to a decided Canadian identity, or to a decided Australian identity. That is not what multiculturalism is. That is the opposite of what multiculturalism is. Multiculturalism means come to Australia and do not assimilate, thus resulting in multiple cultures. When they are actually asked, though, when people are actually given an informed question, 70% of Canadians say they wish minorities and immigrants would do more to assimilate. So had this truly been put to a referendum in Canada, had Canadians actually been asked, hey guys, would you like immigrants to come over here and create cultural enclaves, they would give a definitive no. And I don't doubt that would be similar here in Australia. The American election, for the first time in a long time, was almost entirely based on questions of identity, border, language, culture, and religion. And Donald Trump, a man who loves the West, won. Once without betting, he would not, he would have won the overwhelming majority. We all know this. As Ed Coulter says, Obamacare never would have passed without decades of massive immigration from the third world. Liberals didn't change any minds, they just changed the voters. <laughs> the Western world did not decide to be multicultural. It was imposed on us without our consent. And now every day that mass immigration continues and people come in that do not share our values, it is another day that you lose your sovereignty even further. So what is with this disconnect between the policies being passed in favor of mass immigration and multiculturalism and people's true opinions, what they actually want for their nation? Well, here's my perspective. The disconnect is a result of the fact that discussion of multiculturalism is highly oppressed and shut down. Look at New Zealand's hate speech laws. We've dealt a little bit with them the last bit, they've been fun. Or Canada's free speech caveats, the growing nanny state in ever multicultural London. Or Australia's Human Rights Commission. The multicultural powder cake is so inherently volatile that it cannot be discussed. It cannot afford to look itself in the mirror. And it is becoming increasingly evident that multiculturalism and free speech cannot coexist. Because it seems that in every nation where multiculturalism is brought in, in every single nation where multiculturalism has been introduced, the first rule of multiculturalism is do not speak about multiculturalism. welcomes any and all perspectives, as long as they're not criticisms of multiculturalism. It's like saying you can use any worshipful adjective you like to describe Stalin, and therefore you have free speech. Indeed, the suppression of free speech is necessary. It is a necessary component of the multicultural project. For multiculturalism to succeed, it must shelter itself from criticism and examination for as long as it can until the point at which Westerners have become demographically outnumbered in their own countries. Because after that point, you will have lost your powers to self-determination and your political strength will be crippled. The clampdown on free speech here is just the canary in the coal mine.
foreshadowing demonstration of the unworkability of multiculturalism. Because if even today they refuse to allow debate or critique of these policies, what will this look like in the future? Luckily, this isn't all over yet. Despite the fact that we had a decent amount of our venues cancel on us, that it's been chaos trying to get here, the Australian people spoke up and you made this happen. And thank you for that. Thank you for supporting us. We still have our ability to speak freely, even if it is under attack. And it will be under attack, and that attack is going to get worse and worse every single year as this multicultural project goes on. And that is because free speech is the antidote to multiculturalism. And you don't have to take my word for it. We witnessed this happen in America. No man was more feared by the establishment than Donald J. Trump. And the reason they feared him is because every single thing he stood for threatened to set off this multicultural power play. Well, every other politician bombards us with slogans like, diversity is our strength, multiculturalism is the backbone of this country. Of course, those weren't our own thoughts. No one, none of the people were thinking this. We were simply, we simply had this repeated to us so often that we got too afraid to question it. Trump was the first person who refused to do this. He was the first one to speak the words that Americans have been too afraid to utter. We can all tell something is off. It doesn't make sense that we elect politicians who pretend to love our nations, and then at every turn, they undermine our national spirit. They call us post-national states, they open up our borders, they erase our anthems, and they tear down our history and our statues. We can tell that something is off when it happened some years ago. And Trump's slogan of Make America Great Again, it was the very first. It was the first to acknowledge that America was no longer great. And that something had gone horribly, horribly wrong some time ago that we could not pinpoint. But at the same time, it was also the battle cry and the rekindling of the collective American spirit. And that collective spirit has a unique identity and it cannot survive within a multicultural society. His rhetoric and the rhetoric of other nationalists was a threat because it is true that national multiculturalism is a power cake. And to speak of it directly is to threaten to set it off. For questioning of it could light the match that causes it to explode. And that match is the minds of the people who had finally had articulated for themselves in America the views that they had implicitly felt for so long but could not put into words. The views that they no longer had any national identity or spirit. And they did not know what their future would look like or what their children's future would look like. What languages they would be speaking, what laws they would be ruled by, what God they would worship. And there can only be one answer to these questions, not multiple ones. Most civilizations in the world are well aware of this fact. It's why you don't see Japan droning on about diversity. It's why you don't see Saudi Arabia introducing multicultural policies or trying to replace its population. You'll never hear this kumbaya nonsense from the rest of the world. It is only the Western world, in its great decadence, naivety, that has not accepted this. And I want to point out here, that this is not the fault of the men who founded the West. This is not the fault of the West, but it is a cycle of human civilization. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times, and good times create weak men. And we are in the stage of weak men living in good times. And because the times are still good because strong men fought for them, we act like we succeeded in creating them. But in reality, we are undoing it all. And we are headed once again into that phase of hard times. Yeah. We are living off the fumes of a greater civilization. So don't become comfortable just because this process may take a hundred years. As in Canada, I do suspect, I can tell by this room, that there is a great deal of opposition to multiculturalism and mass immigration. But just as in Canada, your debate is heavily oppressed. 
Those who oppose these policies are afraid to speak. People are afraid to question and criticize because of the persecution they will endure. People are socially bullied and ostracized, fired from their jobs, even physically assaulted. Hate speech laws further dampen the public debate for fear that their dissenting opinions will invite not only vigilante violence, but violence from the government. If Canadians and Australians continue to allow themselves to be suppressed and silenced, then the West will die with us. And in fact, so will this short-lived multicultural project. The most authoritarian and dominant culture will win in the end, and it will be a model. There are many of us that have embraced the end of this discussion. They think, if I speak up, I will be persecuted, and therefore they do not speak up. They embrace their oppression, they take their place down on their knees, and they do what they're told, and watch as their civilization is defiled and denigrated in front of them. Some of them even convince themselves that this is what they want, it's what they prefer. But if you ask me, the fact that we are persecuted for speaking up is not an excuse to stay silent. It is all the more reason why we are obligated and duty-bound to express ourselves and to voice our opposition. To allow ourselves to be bullied into submissions as leftists try to do to us would be a shame and an embarrassment, and a failure to our ancestors who fought and died so that we could live in the greatest civilization on earth.